Order, order. This is a meeting of the Northern Ireland Affairs Select Committee. We are carrying on our inquiry into defence spending in Northern Ireland, and I'm grateful today to be joined in person by a panel of three. Uh, James Cartledge, the uh, uh, Minister of State for Defence Procurement at the Ministry of Defence. Welcome, Minister. Uh, Brigadier Andrew Muddiman, who's the Regional Commander for Scotland and Northern Ireland at the MOD. Welcome, Brigadier. And Barney Kistruck, who's Director for Defence, Industrial Strategy, Prosperity and Exports at the MOD. Thank you very much indeed for attending the committee this morning, gentlemen. Can I move straight on to Harlan and Wolfe? There mm-hmm. have been, obviously, reports in the press about negotiations with that company with regard to a potential 200 million pound loan facility via UK export finance. Uh, could you provide us with an update as to where we are? Um, well, first of all, Mr Chairman, uh, thank you for inviting us. Pleasure to be here um, and uh, look forward to engaging with the committee. Um, as you'll appreciate, there's a limit, very much a limit to what I can say. Uh, I can't, I'm not going to comment on any, we say, speculation on commercially sensitive matters. Um, the only definitive point I want to make is that no decision has been made on financial support for the company. It has been reported that the uh, company have been asking for, in effect, a full loan facility. Guaranteed would often be up to 80%, but it's been asking for more. Are you able to give us a time scale as to when you think these issues are going to be resolved? Um, as I said, I'm, and I'm... Mr Chairman, you probably understand how these things work. I'm afraid I'm, I can't say any more than that no decision has been made yet. Um, what confidence would you have that without such a loan facility that the company would be able to deliver the FSS programme? Um, I'm not going to comment any at all specifically on the loan. No decision has been made. What I can assure the committee um, without prejudice to the the current position that's being speculated on is that um, FSS remains a top priority naval procurement for the Ministry of Defence. Um, we are committed to delivering it, and that will ensure um, continued investment in shipyards in the UK, including in Belfast. Claire Hannah. Thank you very much. Um, Minister, the, the recovery and rebirth of Harland and Wolfe in 2019 actually came on the back of a very determined um, trade union campaign. You may be aware that that site was almost sold for leisure and retail and would have wiped out not only our city's shipbuilding heritage, but just the potential um, for Belfast to be part of, for example, manufacturing in, in, in green technology and, and, and some of the um, industries of the future um, as well <coughs> around decarbonising the economy. What assessment have you made on the implications um, for the shipbuilding sector in Northern Ireland as a whole if this contract were to be lost? Um, and, and I appreciate uh, why you're asking that. I'm not going to be drawn on this because that would imply that I'm going to comment on the speculation that we... It, it just isn't appropriate for ministers to comment on commercially sensitive speculation. I say that without trying to infer anything. Um, all I can tell you is, as a department, in terms of the FSS contract, which is delivering these solid support ships for the Royal Navy, we remain absolutely committed to delivering those three ships. I'll just leave you with the point that it's, it's about that contract, it's about the jobs and the apprenticeships and the capacity currently at Harland Wolf, but it is about um, the wider potential of, 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 of that part of Belfast and, and those industries now and into the future as well. Mm. I mean, I'm ha- more than happy to comment on the point that, uh, without, you know, without any prejudice to yeah. any speculation we're hearing, that obviously appreciate the importance of shipbuilding to Belfast. You know, entirely uh, understand that, um, but uh, I-, I can't be drawn on any of the speculation because it, it is commercially sensitive, um, and I'm afraid all I can confirm on the financial point is that we've made no decision yet on financial support. Carla Lockhart. Thank you. Um, not to labour the point, but I suppose just to, to reiterate and to, to back up what Claire has said about the importance of uh, this industry to uh, that part of Belfast and indeed to Northern Ireland. And uh, <coughs> I believe it's important that the very clear message goes from this committee today uh, that we need intervention, we need to see this issue resolved, and we need to, see, we need to help and support this company build back stronger. Um, the potential is huge, and certainly as we walked around it 
um, on Monday. Um, you know, there was a real sense of excitement for mm. what could happen uh, in, <coughs> on this site going forward. So we cannot stress enough, and I, and I do that on behalf of my, my colleague um, Gavin Robinson, the member for Belfast East, who I know has engaged extensively on this as well. Um, it's important that you take that message. Thank you very much. Is Gavin not attending today? Well, um, we hope he will. He is been, has been taking part in this inquiry as a member of the Defence Select Committee, uh, and he's already played a, an invaluable role. He may well attend later, and if so, I'll give him the chance to ask you. Absolutely. The, the, the interest of the committee is obviously to, is noted. We know the importance of shipbuilding, and of course, the wider defence industry. Mm. Um, and I think there's many, many, many positives to talk about in the wider defence industry, yeah. and we are determined to drive that forward. Yeah. Well, good one. So I think one point that came across very clearly when we were at Harlan and Wolf on Monday was how important it is for the government to be able to have a very competitive environment in order to get good value in terms of defence defence contracts. Mm. And in order to have a competitive environment, you need a number of competitors. And and I think the concern was that, that if sort of Babcock and BA Systems were the only shows in town, it might be more difficult to, in future, to get good <coughs> good value for money and and competition in terms of quality and, and innovation. I mean, would you agree with that? Well, yeah, Rob, it won't surprise you to know, Mr. Gabul, that, um, you know, in principle and without prejudice to any of the current speculation, obviously, you know, <coughs> having competition can be very supportive of innovation. You know, we're talking broadly here about economic theory, absolutely correct. Um, I just, you can appreciate why I don't want to be drawn into a specific discussion of what's happening at the moment. Um, these are commercially sensitive matters, but of course it is correct that, you know, I'm sure the Chancellor would agree in talking about what the wider economy, competition is a crucial way of, of driving innovation, choice, uh, good value for money for taxpayers, etc. Thank you. Well, let's go to the General then. When you look at the figures per person on defence spend, mm. it's a pretty stark uh, reality. You know, defence spend per head in, in the South West, my region, is £5,930. Wales is £780, Northern Ireland £190. Now, we know there'll be historic reasons for that, and a lot of them will be security-related, let's be frank about it. But we moved a long way from that era, and we're in a time now when we're hearing a lot more discussion about in the Republic about its defence capability. And whilst the Republic is a neutral country in terms of NATO and its geopolitical stance, inevitably the island of Ireland has a strategic importance in the Northwest Atlantic, um, people are waking up. Well, if they're not waking up to it, they are working towards understanding how better to uh, prepare the, the island of Ireland for, for you know, it, 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 its security and its safety. And therefore, inevitably, the question of defence investment and spending and defence industry capability is, I think, linked to that. What uh, approach do you take, does the government take generally, to ways in which we can improve that regional disparity and frankly get more investment into defence spending in Northern Ireland? Well it's a very very good question Mr Chairman. I mean first of all you, you'll be aware that the latest figures so for 2022-23 <coughs> end with industry in Northern Ireland was £186 million. That is a, an increase I believe of 20% from the previous year so that's a significant increase so hopefully that's positive. Um, I think that you know, there should be, we should acknowledge that in terms of some of the history of that, defence spend tends to follow where the primes are located. Mm -hmm. Much of the SME work falls in the subcontracting sub area into the primes. Yeah. Uh, and there's some very positive stuff coming out of Tarlis in Belfast, but obviously there, you know, it doesn't have, for example, you know, the BAE sites in Barrow and all this, the, the stuff you're talking about, the southwest is partly because of the infrastructure that's there. I mean, it's quite obvious when you have a very large naval base like Devonport, you're going to have industry growing up around it. But look, I, what I would say is, uh, <coughs> whilst the MOD will always remain a reserve department and one which is entirely national in the way it spends its money, it doesn't allocate on a sort of arbitrary regional basis or, or to the uh, devolved nations, mm. nevertheless, if we spend our money effectively and if we support industry, Northern Ireland should gain from that. And if I may give you one very positive and significant example, I hope, um, you'll be aware, as we confirmed, well, I confirmed last week, 
that the Ministry of Defence is developing a, a very cutting-edge novel weapon called Radio Frequency Directed Energy Weapon. You may have seen some coverage of this. Uh, basically, this is hard kill with radio waves <coughs> against drones, and the crucial point being, with one shot at a cost of about 10p, this weapon uh, can take out multiple drones at once. It's incredibly important when you consider what we're learning from what's happening in Ukraine. And the really positive thing is that the, the prime involved with us is TALIS, and that is involving a lot of capability work in Belfast. So I think that demonstrates in, the ve in a very relevant way the importance of Northern Ireland to the development of our military capability. Because what really matters here, we're in a very serious times, we're looking at what's happening in Ukraine, the threat we face, we've also seen in the Red Sea the importance of, of drones. We don't just have to have offensive capability, we need to be able to defend our armed forces. And I think it's very positive to see Belfast playing its part in helping develop some of that technology. Yeah. I mean, some of the industry go as far as to say that perhaps some sort of target approach, setting a target for increasing spending would be helpful. Now, I know Mr Kistruck in his evidence to the Welsh Affairs Committee has said that you're place agnostic. I understand that. But you also have a political function. You know, we're here to safeguard mm. our union. Absolutely. Um, and also there's a, there's, a, there's a beneficial effect, as I've said, to the whole island of Ireland, I think. So it doesn't have to you know, be a sort of argument that causes yep. more division. What, what, what would you say to that argument, to say that we need to be a bit more specific and bold about how we can reduce that disparity? Mr Chairman, I think we've been pretty bold. We have a defence spending target and it's 2.5% and we're going to achieve it. We've got a fully funded costed plan. Of course, that is defence spending for the whole of the United Kingdom. Yeah. There will never be, I don't think, I, mean, I can't speak for <coughs> any governments of the future, no parliament can bind its successor, but we, you know, I think it would be very difficult in practice, frankly, uh, aside from anything else, to work such a a sort of arbitrary targeting. I've never heard that from industry. I mean, I engage with industry all the time. I was, my first ever SME round table was in Larn on Armed Forces Day last year, mm -hmm. and not a single SME mentioned that to me. Obviously, they want to see more spend and investment. Who wouldn't, frankly? Um, yeah. I've run an SME. I, I know where they're coming from, right? What matters is that the UK government is committed to defence as a whole, and we've sent a very powerful signal with our intent to get to 2.5%, it is funded because the biggest benefit of all, <coughs> if I may say, isn't the industrial benefit, as crucial as that is. Mm. The biggest benefit is the security benefit to the whole of the United Kingdom, of which North Island, Northern Ireland is an absolutely essential, critical part. Yes, I, mean, look, I entirely agree with, with your priorities, but, but I mean, it's important to get people to stop thinking <laughs> about increased defence spend as always a one way street, which. Mm you know, government shelling out and no benefit. The benefits are huge. They're increased revenue, they're increased tax revenue, they're increased uh, skilled and product, product productivity in terms of jobs, increased wages, basically more revenue for, for government. Absolutely. No, look, just, just to be absolutely clear, we want to see this country benefiting as much as possible in, industrially from more defence spending and from the whole budget. And I'm going to use this phrase probably a fair bit today. All other things being equal, Northern Ireland, when spending should rise, should benefit from that along with other parts of the country. Um, I think what, but what's really crucial is it's not just the amount, it's the, it's, it's the value for taxpayers' money, it's the quality, it's ultimately the capability advantage it delivers. That's why we're spending it. We're spending it to defend the country and to give ourselves the ability to deter our adversaries by having superior capability. And I think when you look at Northern Ireland, the, the sort of work I've just spoken about, the cyber capability and capacity it has, particularly the links with universities, um, the, the strength it has in aerospace and space itself, it is well placed to take advantage of that. And I think what really matters is having that um, very close relationship with, between industry and defence. That's, that's the key to it. Um, as you know, I've introduced a new procurement model called the integrated procurement model. And a key yeah. part of that is integration as in government working closely with the defence industry. So a really good example, I think at the end of October this year, there will be, uh, DBT will be hosting a defence and security export uh, event in Northern Ireland to show SMEs how they can strengthen their, you know, their position by exporting more, which is obviously a key part of that industrial resilience. Robert Goodwin. Thank you very much indeed. You mentioned the conflict in Ukraine and the spotlight that's been shone on, on some weapon systems that have been particularly mm. effective. Think about Starstreak and particularly the Saab Enlaw shoulder launch yeah. anti-tank missile and the fact 
there's a, a big monument of, of scrap metal in Kiev, <coughs> showing how effective that was. I mean, has that, has that focused the, the government's attention on the importance of that particular facility at Talos and, and the importance of that? And, and does that sort of skew the... You talk about all other things being equal. Well, we, what we saw in, at Talos on, on Monday was certainly uh, showed how unequal we were in a, in a positive way in terms of the, the capacity <coughs> and the capabilities that could come from that particular plant. I think this is an excellent point and very timely. Um, like you, I visited the, the factory this month, had a uh, really in-depth discussion with staff, apprentices, with management, um, and the point you make is absolutely spot on. It's one I've made several times in the chamber, particularly to questions from um, uh, an all-nine MP who is, shall we say, very diligent in his uh, questioning of ministers, particularly towards, for some reason, the end of EQs and statements. I've never quite understood that, but uh, you know who I'm Wouldn't talking about. Wouldn't mention Strangford by any chance. Might be. Um, and I, Are they not with us today? Oh, well, it's, it's a shame, but he, um, uh, he, he's very, he is very persistent, in, of course, in talking about the importance of defence in Northern Ireland. And as I said, I think several times to him, I've remarked on how proud the country should be of what has been achieved from that plant in delivering extraordinary capability into Ukraine. Um, when you reflect that some years ago uh, there were export deals from Belfast that essentially, should we say, kept, kept that demand going at the site, you look to today, um, there is huge international interest in these munitions. Uh, as has been confirmed publicly, we provided NLAW to Ukraine before the invasion, and everyone knows the role it played when that first column came towards uh, Kyiv. Um, at the start of the invasion, one can speculate, therefore, on their military role as being incredibly important. Um, but you're also right about LMM, Star Street. These are highly capable weapons, um, you know, produced and, 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 and produced from local hands in Northern Ireland. So I think it's, it's a very important, proud story, and uh, we're keen to work with Talis to, to, to do more of that, to, to ensure they're supporting local skills. Um, but also, in particular, taking advantage of the international market because you know, I'm very passionate about the role of export in defence because it's a way of strengthening our allies but also ensuring that long-term aggregate demand, which is how you keep industrial resilience. I think the other area that we saw Northern Ireland has a distinct advantage and could therefore take um, more, more benefit from ramping up to 2.5% of defence spending is in the area of cyber uh, mm. the, at, at Queen's University in particular, we visited to see some of the great work that's done there, the um, <coughs> educational standards and levels that some of the young people in Northern Ireland have, and also something that, that I think we don't talk about very much, not only cyber defensive, but cyber offensive, which yes. is probably something that we probably need to talk about more. I mean, would you suggest that, that as we ramp up spending, that Northern Ireland actually is a very good place to invest in cyber? A couple of points. It's probably a good reason we don't talk an awful lot about <coughs> cyber capability, as you can appreciate. Um, but it's an excellent question. <coughs> it's a good one. And I would just reflect on your point about the quality of education. That When I had that roundtable in Larn with the SMEs from Northern Ireland, they all spoke about how they thought the Northern Ireland education system was extremely good at producing people with good STEM skills, vocational skills. And I, that was, it was something we all remarked upon. It was really striking. So I think that's very positive. But I was just going to turn to Barney to give you a bit more detail about some of the work we're doing to, in, to encourage this, the strong cyber grassroots that there is in Northern Ireland. Absolutely. I mean, I think that the, the cyber sector in Northern Ireland is a real success story. I think it has attracted not only substantial, uh, you know, UK interest, but it is a very substantial recipient of US foreign direct investment, which I think is a testament to the the, the leading capabilities they've got. I think we should also be looking at the cyber sector and thinking about how we can we can learn lessons from the way that the cyber in Northern Ireland has been so successful and apply that to other sectors in terms of how we partner between industry and academia, uh, how we uh, take STEM skills and we grow those through apprenticeship programs. There's a, there's, there's a bunch of lessons around uh, how the, the cyber programs in Northern Ireland have have been so successful that we should, we should be taking away and we should be learning and implementing in, in other areas of the sector. Yes, we, we had a round table with the Prince of Allison. <laughs> And the, the point was made to us that, you know, if, if you give us the orders, we'll have no trouble recruiting the apprentices and tra training them. There's, there's a great pool of talent out there. And, and, and 
not only I think the point was made that motivated people that are keen to get into this industry, <coughs> and, and also because maybe of the sort of um, uh, lack of diversity amongst the population there, in terms of some very sensitive jobs, it might be easier to recruit than maybe where you've got large levels of people maybe not born in, here in the UK. I mean, would you see that as another advantage of Northern Ireland? Yeah, I mean, I think I think the sort of the the, the, the skilled <coughs> workforce that is available in Northern Ireland and the ability to tap that workforce clearly working on the most sensitive projects requires people to be able to both be British nationals and acquire high levels of security clearance that that requires a, a level of residency in the United Kingdom for for an extended period of time. Uh, so that certainly is a factor in being able to to, to grow uh, the sector in Northern Ireland. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Carla Lockhart. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for uh, coming before the, the, the committee today. Um, I have a few questions. The first is really around the recent uh, Defending Britain publication and uh, the fact that it states that the government work, will work to establish defence regional partnerships. I suppose my question would be, what will these look like? And will you be looking to establish a partnership in Northern Ireland? I think it's something we're definitely considering. Um, I think you referred to the Safeguard in the Union uh, proposals that we, we published earlier in the year. Uh, and as you know, this <coughs> includes a commitment to a review of defence in, in Northern Ireland. And I think, if I may say, the, the real, the most positive aim within that, as I see it, because I think it's so important is ultimately about promoting defence more. Mm. This is not just about investment internally or externally. It's about, to the, to the population as a whole, saying, look, this, this, is, this is an area of the economy which offers amazing opportunity. So yes, we are considering that at the moment. Um, but I think, <clears throat> I think, if I may say, my observation is that what really matters here is, is if you like, that private sector engagement. We, we've heard from Barney about the US uh, inward investment success in cyber, which is really positive. Northern Ireland is proving there that it can attract the kind of investment that is, that's what really makes the difference. And, and, and if I go back to Mr. Goodwill's question, actually there is going to be the demand, you know, I'm afraid for, for negative reasons, if we're honest, there is going to be the demand on the defence sector for some time to come. If you look at countries other than the UK increasing their GDP spend on defence, <coughs> Poland going to 4%. Um, the huge interest we're seeing internationally, and, and, and Talis are very much in that. When I've been on at some of our big export trade fairs in major uh, major markets, there's a lot of interest in, in Talis. So I think, although it's important what government does, and we're absolutely committed under our safeguard and union promises to deliver that and a review, um, I think that you know the most important thing is firing up uh, the investment from the private sector. <laughs> And finally, the point I always make, in our sector, um, there's this phrase called the demand signal. And the demand signal is what companies want to see from government, i.e. they want to wait until there is a definitive order before they invest. Whereas what I always challenge them about is we want a supply. If they want a demand signal, I want a supply signal. And that means proactively investing in skills, apprenticeships. Um, and I actually think we are, we are seeing that now, but it's saying to the defence sector, to investors, to dual-use companies who may not yet be actively invested in defence, when you look at the extraordinary opportunity there is now in, in growth in global investment in defence, we should be taking advantage of that, and Northern Ireland is very well placed to do so. Yeah, um, absolutely. Northern Ireland is well placed, and you can see that very evident on the ground in terms of even the companies that we have visited. Mm. Um, but I suppose... Um, when we spoke with many of them, there was a, a very clear number of needs identified from a government mm. perspective because at the end of the day, these companies can't just invest on a whim. They need to know that there is that. And I think one of the SMEs in the group that we had talked about a slow drumbeat yeah. of um, requests for, for, for certain uh, items. They find very much that the government will say, we need a thousand of these, we need whatever, whatever, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's no sort of um, just long-term vision. So I suppose that would be a point that, uh, that I think is important that we make. You talk about promoting um, the, the defence and um, industry around uh, the United Kingdom. Well, I would say Northern Ireland has been missing from that promotion. Um, I, certainly from the businesses that we spoke with, 
Um, there's a lack of, say, road shows in Northern Ireland. There's a lack of you know, ability for even businesses to find out and hear what is coming onto the market in terms of um, uh, procurement, etc. Um, so in my mind, and this is probably the next question, what are the plans around um, a hub being uh, developed in Northern Ireland to help coordinate that and coordinate uh, a better strategic uh, long-term uh, sustain- sustainable investment into, into Northern Ireland? All very, very good question. I'm going to bring Barney <coughs> in a minute on some of the specifics, that, particularly on DASA, because I think that's really important. There's several parts of this. Um, in, in terms of very formative uh, start-up, proposals, etc. We do have something called DASA, Defence and Security Accelerator, which provides funds to new ideas to ensure they get through what we euphemistically call the valley of death, where you know startup ideas are born and never turn into something that's developed. Right. The Prime Minister, when he made his 2.5% speech, was very, was very clear, we want to have more of the stuff we spend R&D on turned into actual capability used by the armed forces or exported to our allies. <coughs> so that's an, that's an important way. And uh, Barney's going to talk about how data works in Northern Ireland. I think we've spent something like £2.7 million on about 14 projects, but it's how we engage the presence we have out there. But I, I just think there's on, the really important point you make, which all SMEs say, and I totally understand this. I, I ran an SME. It wasn't in defence, but I understand how they feel. They want to know that there's a long-term pipeline that they can know about and that can give them the security uh, of, of being able to plan and invest. I totally understand that. And obviously, we want to do that as far as possible. I would say there's two key factors. That's why export is so important, because the UK market will never be big enough to sustain all the current businesses all of the time. This isn't sufficient demand. Um, I've met a number of SMEs, including in Northern Ireland, who have successful export operation, and it's, it's di- difficult, but it's one of those areas where it tends to be, once you get a toehold, you can then grow on it. And some of the SMEs I've met are very successful. That's 90% of their revenue is export. And that, is, that makes them much more sustainable. And I, you know, we, I think we'll be holding 15 trade shows abroad or in the UK in the next financial year, significant ones. Um, so this will be in key markets or you know, next year, DSEI, etc. And absolutely, we are promoting Northern Ireland businesses uh, at those events. Um, and as I said, I've, I've been abroad in key markets, you know, I've been to defence shows in Turkey, uh, Czech Republic, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, <coughs> where we are um, absolutely promoting, promoting Northern Ireland companies and all UK defence companies. Um, so I think that's really important. I also think um, the, the confirmation of going to 2.5% with a funded plan also sends a signal that there will be more work available. Of course, you can never guarantee specific companies will win it because we have procurement processes. So therefore, how do you have the transparency that you want? How can they have sight of that? So if two really important steps. Um, the first is the Procurement Act that's coming in. Certain legislative changes will make it easier to share the, if you like, advanced look of our forward uh, planning and requirements. Um, and also will enable greater early stage engagement with business. But in terms of our new procurement model, I'm absolutely clear the fourth part of that, there are five key parts, the fourth is a much deeper relationship with industry to drive innovation. And, And I want to see more and more engagement at secret with industry. The reason why it's a secret is if I, you know, if I give an example, for a very inspiring example, it, was, it wasn't an Northern Ireland company, but just to, to highlight the point, it was with a UK SME who was providing a drone into Ukraine. I went to see them, and they were getting feedback from the front line, obviously, ultimately, from MOD, which enabled them to spirally develop that product. So it returned to Ukraine as a to remain competitive. I thought that, to me, was like a version of procurement I'd never seen before, given it's normally quite slow and and ponderous and so on. So that's why engaging at secret is important. We are, there are limitations on how easily we can do that outside MOD main building, for reasons you can obviously imagine. We are going to do our first event outside London in Portsmouth in July, but that's because Portsmouth being a major naval base, it's easier to hold something at secret. I want to hold those sort of events over time all over the UK, including Northern Ireland. It is it's just that it's practically challenged, but I absolutely want to do that. Um, I held an SME forum there myself. 
You heard that we're going to have the October event about exports in Northern Ireland. So yes, I do want to give greater sight of our of the forward order book and requirements, if you like. And, and I think we're doing a lot in that space. But Barney, I thought, I just thought on the on DASA and how it actually <coughs> physically engages with Northern Ireland. Just before, what about the Sorry. hub? Sorry. What about the hub? That is certainly something that everyone has agreed on. Yep. Uh, feel that it would be really beneficial. To okay, that's what I was going to bring in Barney on. So I think I think we absolutely need to make sure that we are um, uh, supporting businesses in Northern Ireland in an appropriate way. I think there is a sort of the minister mentioned the uh, the UK DSE event uh, later in the year. There is a sort of there is a DASA person who provides support to Northern Irish businesses. Uh, now, the minister mentioned the the two point two million pounds that have been that have been spent through that project there are a range of other things that we need to do to ensure we are connecting northern irish businesses with uh the 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 support that is available so the defense technology exploitation program has given grants um and we're working to uh with industry and with academic partners to establish uh, a, 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 a regional defense and security cluster which will enable us to bring together those that are both currently in the sector and uh, are going to, uh, you know, wish to enter the sector in the future to, to ensure that we are providing appropriate support to businesses. I think the minister sort of alluded earlier to the to the work that the government's committed to do on uh, s on on strengthening uh, the defence <coughs> industry's role in Northern Ireland through a review. I think that is probably the mechanism through which we we assess the 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 most appropriate and the most effective interventions that we can do over and above what's currently in place to to support those businesses. And when will the review take place? Uh, so the expectation is it will be launched before summer recess um, and uh, subject to sort of progress on that will report to the Defence Secretary in 2025. Well, I, I would just emphasise, because I, I appreciate, you're keen to see that, and, I, and you know, there is a limit to how quickly we can do these things. But I just want to em emphasise, there is, if you talk about a hub, mm. we already have in Northern Ireland incredible things happening in defence. We're talking about a... a in Belfast, a company which has provided the most decisive munition, arguably in the early stage, of the first conflict in Europe involving an alpha military peer since 1945, right? The country with the world's largest nuclear arsenal, as far as we're aware. And that's a pretty decisive uh, role for defence industry. Um, when you, Around that, you look at the potential in cyber, what I've referred to in terms of novel weapons, uh, in the excellent, you know, what, the feedback we've had about the quality of people coming out of schools and colleges in Northern Ireland, um, and yes, the investment in shipbuilding and so on. I do think we've already got the makings of that, and I think actually Northern Ireland's really well placed <coughs> to take advantage of more private investment. I mean, if I talk about SMEs, um, I was recently uh, in, uh, visiting the RCO, which is part of the Royal Air Force, uh, who are working with um, KX, which is a Northern Ireland Defence SME, working on AI in a really interesting um, deploy uh, deployable way. I can't talk about a huge amount of it, but it's, it really makes a difference. It's one of the good ways in which AI can really support defence. And this is a Northern Ireland startup at the heart of that. Um, th what I mean is, is they're not waiting for a hub and I'm, that doesn't mean it's not important and that the review, isn't, the review is not really significant in terms of what it says about the government's commitment politically to defence in Northern Ireland but I don't think we have to wait for that I think there's huge amount of potential already there's investment that wants we want to get more investment into defence so I'll just make one final point if I may Mr yeah. Chairman which I, is a frustration for me uh, there has been a limitation on investment in the whole of the UK through something called ESG which is uh, those rules which, for example, some funds have chosen not to invest in defence because it's seen as, should we say, to put it bluntly, not as morally worthy as some things. Whereas I think what we've learned about Ukraine is you need a defence industry to have peace, which, by the way, is the number one goal of the UN Sustainable Development Charter. And I think, to be honest, if we can all communicate that message, <coughs> drive up investment into defence per se, and that will benefit every part of the UK as well. Mm. Thank you very much. Stephen Farrell. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, good morning, Minister, and, and uh, your colleagues. Um, just picking up on a few um, of the previous questions first before coming to um, some of my own questions. Um, 
Minister, you just talked there about the, the need for, for, for preparation. So it's one of the comments that has been made to us by uh, Talis in particular, but no doubt you hear this across the UK mm. as well, is in terms of managing um, supply and demand at times, um, Talis will get a uh, request for um, a lot of um, missiles and launchers in a very short order, and then it goes quiet for a bit, then it, it peaks in terms of how you can better level that sort of process out um, so companies can better manage um, what, what they're doing in a more efficient way. Well, thank you, um, Stephen. That is an excellent question, which speaks to one of our key priorities. And I absolutely mean So when I, I made my statement on the 28th of February launching our integrated procurement model, and I said one of the first real goals of that was always what we call always-on production. Mm-hmm. Now, this is, if you like, to a very techie sort of procurement audience, this is like the nirvana. Because if you can achieve always on production, it means rather than saying as a government, well, look, we've got to spend this amount to have a huge stockpile, which means our armed forces can theoretically survive for many months firing at a rapid rate through a NATO standard or whatever, rather than that, which is potentially very inefficient use of public money, particularly when there'll be lots of international demand for that in the interim, it's, it's getting to a level of UK-driven demand, which when you add in export and international, enables a thriving supply chain so that should you have what we might call a more bellicose environment, a more heightened military tension, you can increase your order. Because, and this, and Northern Ireland is so relevant to this point, I've made this in a number of speeches on procurement, I always go back to the point that after the invasion of Ukraine, metaphorically obviously, you know, someone in MOD picked up the phone to Tarlis in Northern Ireland and said, can we have some more, you know, LMM, Starstreak or whatever? And they said, sure, if you're happy to wait few years because we haven't made these things for a while, right? It was, it, it's so illustrative of this very point. And so the ideal scenario is to get to, you know, obviously strong orders from UK MOD, but equally uh, adding in export and driving up the aggregate demand so that you have always on production. I, that is absolutely a goal, and I do think it is possible that we can achieve that. Sure. Thank, you. Thank you for that. Um, just maybe building slightly on Carla's point around around the hub. I'm sort of very conscious of um, the brigadier with us, and I think your title is the commander for Scotland and Northern Ireland. One of the things we often hear is that Northern Ireland is seen as an appendage um, rather than an entity in its own right. So, um, in many considerations, it's Scotland and, and Northern Ireland. So we're the and bit, um, and. Uh, Perhaps we would advocate that Northern Ireland stands on its own feet. I appreciate we're slightly smaller in size uh, than, than Scotland, but I think that would give a lot more confidence that um, Northern Ireland is, is being seen and regarded in its, own, in its own right. Well, I hope I've shown that I'm absolutely positive about the potential of Northern Ireland to benefit massively from the defence industry, from the growth in defence spending. But I think on this operational description in relation to yes, Scotland Northern Ireland, I'll hand over to the Brigadier. Okay, so my title, I'm the Naval Regional Commander for Scotland and Northern Ireland. Yep. As you know, the Royal Navy's got a small footprint in Northern Ireland, a very small regular footprint. Um, So the the title really reflects the fact that uh, my headquarters is in Scotland, but I spend, I would suggest, a disproportionate amount of my time in Northern Ireland for precisely the reason of the defence industry considerations and the complete criticality of that to the Royal Navy's output. So though we might only have four regular personnel stationed in Northern Ireland, the defence industrial relevance of it to the Navy is, dis- is disproportionate. So um, I think that the, the premise of the question could be a little bit misleading. Um, it was to infer that, or one was to infer that, I w- you know, Northern Ireland was just a bit part of my job. Yeah. It's a major part of my job. Absolutely. Well, I, and to be very clear, this was not in any way a, a um, reference. You, you had the misfortune of being introduced today as Scotland and, Nor- and Northern Ireland, but we hear it in other realms in terms of how the MOD approaches um, Northern Ireland. So it was a general point rather than something that was very specific to, to, to your good self in, in that particular uh, r- regard. Um, could I turn just to the um, Safeguarding Union um, Command um, paper and talk about the, first of all, the timing of the review, and then perhaps a, a very particular um, question where the command paper refers to untapped resources in Northern Ireland in terms of defence procurement. Maybe expand in terms of what that sort of line potentially means. Um, well, the timing, I think, Barney, did answer this okay. point. Um, uh, in terms of untapped resources, um, could you? It's 75 of the command paper, strengthening defence industries. So it starts by saying, recognise the untapped resources available to the, to the defence industry in Northern Ireland. The government is c- committed to... I'm really sorry, Mr. Are you saying untapped or on tap? Untapped. 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 U-N-T-A-P-P-E-D. My apologies. Yes, that's right. Sorry. Um, 
uh, I, I, I have no doubt there are untapped resources. Um, I, I, I think I think I think Northern Ireland has massive potential. I, I don't think in many cases it's about potential. I think it's already delivering. I, I mean, we've gone through that, um, but it certainly can do more. And I and, I, and my as I said. I, the, the review is really important. It, as you say, it comes from our Safeguarding the Union command paper. It's a, it's a, it's a real way of looking at how we work institutionally through defence, because it is, what is absolutely true is defence will always be a very political, and I use a small p, government-dominated uh, area. For obvious reasons, it's the only area where government will always have a monopoly. Um, if not, there's something probably going wrong. But, um, you know, it is absolutely a, a highly government-dominated area of industry, but <coughs> that notwithstanding, um, if you take, I mean, take the example of dual use companies, I think we don't do enough, and I'm happy to admit, I think across the UK we still don't do enough to appeal to those companies which are in a potentially dual use technology but haven't really thought about defence. Now, I'm looking at ways we can address that. We, we hold our fest, what's it, is it AI fest? I can remember. Um, mm. AI fest. I'm not sure. I think there is an AI fest, just to be clear, where um, <laughs> we get companies that aren't necessarily developing for defence to see if their application could have a dual use. So, so when you think of the technology base in Northern Ireland, there will be businesses there that have potential defence relevance that may not know it. Um, if you look at some of the companies we've invested in in Northern Ireland through DASA, the company, is it called Kistruck, I think it is? Um, the, this is a, a way of registering on a... Is that your surname? Yeah. Uh, my apologies. It's very similar to your yeah, surname, yeah, the name of that company. Uh, let me just double-check. Hold on. So, is it Konsetsu? Yes. Kinsetsu, yeah. Who attended my round table in Larn, I'm pleased to say. Um, you know, that sort of technology, um, you, can, you, you could see how that could... I, I don't actually know whether it has a dual-use application, but you see how it could... I think that's where there's a huge amount of untapped potential. I mean, I think... So, so I wasn't in post at the point at which the command paper was published, but my interpretation of that untapped, untapped resource is about skills, it's about workforce, yes. it's about the SME environment, it's about, it's about the fact that there, is, there, there, there are the conditions in Northern Ireland in terms of the, the, the workforce uh, and the, 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 the business environment that's already there that means that... There is the potential that, um, with with uh, you know appropriate support, and you know that is a whole bunch of things, not just for Northern Ireland, but actually how the MAD deals with small and medium. Uh, sized enterprises in general, the understanding we have of the supply chain to to make full and effective use of that in a mm. way that I think has happened in the cyber sector as we spoke about earlier. But there is probably more that we can do in the in the broader defence sector. My final question, is largely around sort of cultural perceptions of Northern Ireland. Obviously, we have the legacy of of the troubles, uh, which was very real, obviously for uh, for people who, who served in mm. the the, ver the various uh, services during that time. Um, Perhaps in, in, in two ways. Is there still a hangover to a certain extent? And we, we have heard this from some um, <coughs> SMEs and others in, in Northern Ireland that the MOD still sees Northern Ireland as a place apart. It's not as normal as Great Britain would be. And when people are going there, they're, they're still being briefed about sort of it's just being a little, little bit more careful. And obviously, there's still an ongoing terrorist threat. But um, nonetheless, for someone in a, in a suit, it's, it's perfectly normal <coughs> doing business. And at the same time, um, to what extent is there barriers or delays in terms of security clearance, which creates additional bureaucracy and barriers for Northern Ireland companies? Do we have figures that would maybe give us comfort that it's no worse or, or better than any other part of the UK? Or are we seeing a situation where it is that little bit slower getting security clearance for companies and personnel to, to operate in certain senses? I'm going to turn to my law wingman, if, if I may, Mr Ferry. Um, so, first of all, on the, the perception of Northern Ireland in, in the forces, and then we've got some. We have, I think we do have some stats on uh, vetting and so on. So, um, Northern Ireland, from a, uh, a military perspective, a joint that's a joint military perspective from all the services, is on, is on a is on a pathway um, towards what we call normalisation. I that's normalising the military relationship with the with the civil populace. But clearly, um, everybody in this room is aware that there are there are there are constraints and limitations to the extent that that could replicate. Uh, mm -hmm. Another area of the, another area of GB main, on GB mainland. Mm -hmm. So um, th th there are clearly um, barriers to at the moment to how far that, that that can go, and that's a matter for the security services who regularly review the the, the posture that we adopt. But but believe me, um, and I speak on behalf of the Joint Military Commander for, for Northern Ireland. Um, he, he is as keen as anybody to see that normalisation progress. 
and we have made several attempts over the past two years to, um, you know, to, to keep pushing that uh, in the direction that I think you're alluding to, um, but there are real life restraints on that and real life events which have, which have got in the way of, of, of the trajectory going quite how we would like it. I think that's probably the most uh, correct answer I can give in terms of our profile. However, um, that said, uh, I've never found it a physical uh, barrier to me uh, to get over to Northern Ireland and get out and about on the ground, visit. Certainly, it's never been an impediment to me visiting a defence company, uh, which I do very, very regularly, um, and it's never been an impediment to having a conversation about um, a capability or a dual-use technology or any other thing, and that there's a lot of that that happens completely mm -hmm. regardless of any security concerns. So I would definitely give you that reassurance. Um, the, the, the second part of the question, could you just repeat that? It was around uh, the security of Etting. I was going to ask Barney. Yeah. Going to pick it up? So, so I don't have to hand Northern Ireland specific vetting figures. There has been a challenge with the vetting process in general across the United Kingdom. We have recovered that to a very great extent and are now meeting, I think, 95% of uh, new um, high-level security clearance uh, processing sort of on time. Um, I'm not I'm genuinely not sure if it is possible to break that down by region, but I'm very happy to go away and write to the committee if, if, if we can provide further information. Back to us, I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Can I go to Damien Collins, please? <coughs> thank you, Chair. Um, <coughs> Minister, I wonder if I could just go back to Holland and Wolf, if I, if I may. Mm. Um, the finance that it would seem that Harlan and Wolf is seeking is in order to invest in its shipyard in order to fulfil the contract that it has taken out with the, with the government. What assessment was made when, as part of the procurement decision to award the contract as to whether Harlan and Wolf had the resources it needed to fulfil it? This is commercially sensitive, I'm afraid, Mr Collins. I'm afraid I'm not prepared to do it. I'm not asking you about the loan. I don't think it's commercially sensitive. I'm just asking about your contingency planning. The contract decision to award the contract was made. Presumably, there must have been some consideration of the suitability of that contract when it was awarded. Um, even if, even if um, I was able to talk about the earlier part, that specific question would still be commercially sensitive. But the point is, in the context we are in, where there is speculation about commercial sensitivities, I'm not prepared to go into further detail. <laughs> Presumably, it would be fair to say that, you are, that the MOD didn't have any concerns uh, when the contract was awarded. Um, um, that's, that, as I say, that is clearly commercially sensitive. Well, it's, it's, I mean, the, the alternative view would be surprising if you did. It would be surprising if you, a contract was awarded to a company you didn't think would fulfil it. Um, well, it is a matter of record that we awarded the contract at the time. Um, what I've said earlier, and I repeat again, we are absolutely committed to delivering the FSS contract. It is a, a high priority to have these three solid support ships. Um, but when you're in a situation like this where there is speculation swirling around, it's not helpful, I think, for a minister to comment. So th these, um, these loan negotiations apparently go on for six months or more without resolution. At what point, um, if there isn't a resolution, regardless of what the commercial implications are for Holland and Wolf of that, at what point <coughs> do you start to have concerns about whether the contract will be fulfilled within the time scale it was envisaged? Um, well... What I can say, as I said earlier, is we are committed to delivering the FSS contract um, and to doing so on time, on schedule and on budget. Okay, so at the moment this is not this is, this is not caused you to reflect on those those timelines. Um, Mr Collins, you've been a minister, you know how it works. Um, uh, I'm not going to say anything that would potentially pro uh, provide inference in relation to current speculation and therefore I think it wouldn't be appropriate for me to specifically answer that. But as, as minister, I think it's reasonable to ask you your responsibilities is are you, you or your officials making contingency plans in case there is a problem here? Because from what we're being told, if there is a problem, um, that c when the contract was awarded to Harlan the Wolf, it was considered existential uh, and, and, a, and a key driver of the renaissance of shipbuilding in the UK, but also a, a contract that would guarantee the survival of that ship. Um, so... What is it, are you and, the, and your department making plans for looking for alternative suppliers if this contract can't be fulfilled? I, I'm going to treat each member of the committee fairly and equally and say I'm afraid and repeat the point that I can't comment on those mm. matters because of the current commercial speculation. And, and I suppose the final question is, I, I, think, I, think these are, I think these are separate to the commercial negotiations because regardless of what the outcome of those negotiations are, 
um, we're not in a position to know what the consequences for that company or not, and it'd be wrong for us to speculate. But I think it's reasonable to ask you what contingent, contingency planning you have to ensure the contracts you've placed are fulfilled, because ultimately your responsibility is not per se for the Harland Wolf ship, shipyard, it's to make sure the Navy has the ships it needs. As, as I said, we are committed to delivering the FSS contract and, and uh, delivering those three ships to the Navy. Okay. But I, but I will have to leave it, <coughs> leave that where it is. But I think it, there, there is a legitimate concern as to say how how can how will that contract be fulfilled uh, if this if, mm. if this speculation continues? Because there must come a point <coughs> where the decision has to be made, and if the decision goes against the shipyard, it's reasonable to ask not just what the consequences of that yard are, but also what the consequences is for the MOD in its desire to make sure the contract is fulfilled. Um, these are market sensitive matters, and I'm afraid I'm not yeah. going to comment further. It's funny, you mentioned that you used the term industrial resilience <laughs> earlier on. Um, I mean, what, uh, where do you think the UK stands in terms of its resilience, in terms of being able to build ships that the Navy needs, um, if, it, if that capability in Northern Ireland is lost? Again, you're trying to bring in the uh, current speculation around the position of Harlem Wolf, which I'm not going to comment on. Uh, if there is a general question about. <coughs> Uh, the uh, wider UK shipbuilding. Um, you know, we have, I think, a, a very successful story to tell about the National Shipbuilding Office, the way we've um, delivered uh, orders benefiting every part of the country right across the Union, um, and of course driving uh, international demand as well. As I confirmed at oral questions this week, um, if you take all of the orders that are currently uh, extant internationally into UK shipyards, we are arguably by value, and particularly because of AUKUS, the, have the largest order book by value for naval exports. Um, I won't ask again about it, but I think it, it does. I think the question does hang there because the, the implications are wider than the implications for that business because this was held up as a flagship co project and contract uh, by the National Shipbuilding Office when it was awarded. I just wanted to ask briefly just on... on um, Northern Ireland, defence spending in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the very substantial increase. What proportion of that is due to the uh, orders for the Enlaw rockets from Talos? Well, I, I, I would imagine a significant part of it. Um, one of the issues with Northern Ireland, if you like, in terms of that spending, is it only has one major prime. Um, obviously, you have Spirit Aero Systems who contributes <coughs> into aerospace, uh, into aerospace um, and some other significant businesses, but they are the only major prime, I would say. Um, and so, therefore, there will be volatility linked to their income stream. But the good news is, obviously, that's been positive very recently, although for negative reasons, which ultimately arise from the invasion. Yeah, and I mean, is there? Um, I mean, uh, in terms of the resilience of that of the supply chain needed to uh, fulfil those those contracts, obviously. The demand is extremely high at the moment. Mm. We may reach a point where, for good reasons, the demand isn't quite as significant as it is. Um, do you think there? Are, do you think that the capability they have will be met by contracts, other overseas contracts, or do do you think what support can you give to that business thinking of its future planning? Well, we don't have to speculate because, um, and I was, I was first of all, I go back to the point I said to Mr. Farry around always on production, which is our goal. Um, but if you look back, um, when I was visiting the plant, we were talking about um, how previously, when we had what we thought was peace, inverted commas, obviously at any given time there's conflict in the world, but relatively speaking, and not having uh, uh, the sort of uh, war on our doorsteps in, in Eastern Europe, as it were, um, they were, uh, Talis, um, were very... Uh, I wouldn't say overly reliant, but they did need orders that came through, particularly from Southeast Asia, um, which interestingly helped them to develop their product base and develop some of the products that we now know today. And so to me, that is an absolutely crystallized example of the importance of export. And if I may, because you asked about resilience, we are undertaking a fundamental reform of procurement. And you know, people will say to me, Minister, we've heard it many times before. Um, but one area where I, I just think this will leave a lasting impact if it is effectively delivered and maintained in, in MOD is that um, when I became the procurement minister, I was really struck by, in, to put it bluntly, there was simply not sufficient consideration given to export when setting out those requirements early on in procurement. Mm. It was a bit of an afterthought, if I may say. I don't <coughs> say that critically. It's just that the disposition then was primarily focused on acquiring the military capability. Um, whereas... I think everyone's now learnt that if you don't have export to give you 
resilient supply chains, there's a real risk to your supply chain in the interim. I think this is something the French have known for a long time, and Israel to a certain extent, which is why they prioritise export so importantly. And the change that I want to see in place is that when we consider significant programmes, or smaller ones for that matter, right from the beginning, when that first document comes into ministers, it, it tells you what the export potential is. Because that gives you two key advantages. The first one is that you can actually start an export campaign there and then, because it takes countries many years to order major defence items, and the earlier you can get in and start marketing, the better. The second one is a big failing in procurement, perhaps perceptive, but certainly there are examples where this has been true, is the what we call overly exquisite requirement setting. And um, I'm, I'm certain that if you have to show that you are considering international demand, I think that is a bit of a safety valve against being overly exquisite because the chances are there'll be a trade-off between having something that's perfect for UK and something you can market more internationally. So I think it's a really good change and if we can implement that effectively through governance and so on, I think that will have a real impact. Finally, if I may, that's right. Uh, the, um, I think you spoke a bit about it today, the Secretary of State for Defence, I think, spoke when he made the announcement about the increase to 2.5% that you can't just turn on that capability, yes. uh, you have to plan for it. Um, you know, what would your message be to the Defence Secretary in Northern Ireland about what it can do to make itself attractive to benefit from that increased investment? Well, as I say, I, you know, I use this phrase as a supply signal, which is this idea that, as is normal in non-defence businesses, you have natural, what we call animal spirits of entrepreneurialism, to seize opportunities, invest, take some risk. Now, it is harder in defence, because those companies will say to me, ah, oh, but Minister, how do we know you're actually going to, you're going to buy it? Well, we know at this moment there's a wall of demand out there internationally that this country's brand is almost second to none in terms of uh, its armed forces internationally. When we procure something, there will be other countries who will certainly consider it, if not go on to actually procure it. And I think I'd just take advantage of that opportunity. I know it's not easy for, for SME startups. That's why we have DASA. We have the support that we give to those. And I think... Uh, one area we need to improve is, is when we make R&D investments or we support you know, those early startups, as the Prime Minister said in that speech, ensuring more of those early investments actually become pulled through successful success stories. You know, if I go back to those SMEs, Mr Chairman, that were at my round table in Larne, you know, you look at them. So we had, I said, Konsetsu, the one I was talking about, they're providing this tracking locator solution. That is dual use. Okay, that's used on the carrier, but it's clearly dual use. We had um, a company called Brolis, which makes dismounted soldier systems. These are rifle scopes, optics. I'm sure there will be, notwithstanding that I don't, I can't say specifically that they will have everything every other country requires. Generally speaking, that sort of materiel is in demand at the moment. And I think it underlines why my message to businesses seize the day and we'll support you. That's why we're having the export trade fair in October. Thank you very much. Claire Hannah. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. I want to, co to, to come back to SMEs as well, and I know you um, uh, touched on your responses to Carla, um, some of the proposals that the committee had heard from SMEs. Um, the key figure, uh, or the one that jumps out, is the fact that only 0.15% of MOD's total spend with SMEs um, has been in, in Northern Ireland. H how do you account for that? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is a difficult one to measure because I think the official figure is like £2 million, the most recent one. But that, when you consider like, whether you think what we spend in Northern Ireland is significant or not, it's clearly vastly more than that. And it's because what it reflects is you've got one major prime and, of course, the payments go to the prime and then down the supply chain. So there's very, there's relatively speaking, not much by way of direct payment from MOD to SMEs. Um, you know, there will be... What, there are one or two significant, what we call second, second order. Uh, spirit is obviously a good example. Mm. Um, but prime, that'll be the prime reason why that is the case. But it doesn't mean we wouldn't want it to be more. I wouldn't, I'm not trying to pretend that I don't want it to be higher. Uh, ac across the board, your target was 25% of procurement directly or indirectly to SMEs. Was that target met? It does say or indirectly. So that's why it's difficult to measure because it is difficult to measure. Do you have any data on on indirect impact in the in the supply chain? Is that something you you capture on on uh, spillover benefits to SME? 
So I think I, uh, this is a very difficult thing to measure. Uh, we we have done a lot of work, and, just, and, I, and I'm asking because there are targets for yeah. it. I appreciate that these are which is fair. That's things, fair. But you, you have named the targets. We have we have done a lot of work to enhance the visibility that we have of the supply chain and how money is flowing down the supply chain. But I don't think I could sit here and say in good conscience to the committee that we we have full visibility of that at this stage. According to my uh, start in front of my brief in front of me. Across the UK, indirect spend accounts for around three quarters of our business with SMEs. Okay. One should not infer an absolute figure from that because we don't have the actual figures, but that's. And you have uh, suppliers, forums, and SME working yes. groups. What 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 representation is there from Northern Ireland on those? Um, well, I think uh, we certainly have representation. Um, I know on the uh, defence suppliers forum we have representation from Talis um, for certain. Um, we also actually, because uh, of the importance of skills, we have two Northern Ireland representatives on the uh, on our shipbuilding skills task force. Um, sorry, skills delivery group. Skills delivery group, correct is the correct title. Um, uh, but I, but look, as, as I said earlier, I, I just think it's important. It is, and, and, and it's a, it's a, it's 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 really significant that we've made the. The promise that we have in relation to the, re the review, I think that will be a substantive opportunity to look at things like hubs and how we work in terms of engagement, etc. I, I would just emphasise that what really matters is that the demand signal internationally and from the UK is strong at the moment. I think that I fear that is likely to be sustained. Um, and when you look at the potential Northern Ireland has, it's cyber base, aerospace. Obviously, Talis, but the companies that feed into that supply chain. I think it's it is well placed to take advantage of that. Um, and I say I've met SMEs, not just the ones I met that day, but I was referring to KX, as they're called. That there are companies that are, uh, have got that get up and go and are seizing opportunities. They're winning investment from America and so on. There is no reason to stop for that for that entrepreneurial activity to have to wait. Would be my key point. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. I just want to come back to FSS. I know we've heard your answers. Is it your absolute ambition to make sure that the construction of FSS begins in 2025? Yes. So the plan is that construction uh, of FSS will start next year. Just one final question about skills. Um, how much work is being done between your department and the Department for the Economy and the Executive in Stormont? Um, well, uh, we do engage a lot at an official level, but um, I think the Brigadier wanted to come in on yeah. that. Um, so I can, I can help you with that, Chair. So uh, the Royal Navy has a programme, which is the Maritime Enterprise <coughs> Programme. <Yeah. coughs> we are really in that business to promote uh, a more um, efficient uh, relationship, a non-commercial relationship. So that's not the commercial relationship between DNS and um, defence providers, but between the Navy, which owns the requirement and the, the downstream um, defence industry, SMEs, but also to a lesser extent the primes. And we've been operating in Northern Ireland in that capacity for about two, two and a half years. Mm -hmm. We have direct dealings with the um, Northern Ireland Executive's arm's length bodies for that, um, Invest NI in particular. One of the major um, results that we've had from that programme in Northern Ireland has been the cluster development we've achieved through um, NIMO. So we've been a key um, exponent of that, uh, and now Northern Ireland has its own uh, maritime and offshore cluster, uh, which is really centred around gluing together the entirety of the, of, of the maritime sector around Belfast Harbour uh, with interests not only in e-ferries, but also going right out to offshore uh, work. Mm. And the skills aspect to that has been fundamental, and we've done a lot of work with the Northern Ireland Executive for that particular purpose, and we continue to work with Invest NI to deepen our, the relationship between the college sector in Northern Ireland and key um, uh, defence suppliers, and we'll continue to do that because there's lots, there's lots more to do there to, to try and just consolidate that, that pipeline. So I think if skills is the main touch point there, but it's not just with the executive, but it's also at local level uh, and with Belfast City Council. Uh, and with colleges uh, all over Northern Ireland. So it's, it's the NIE, but it's its arm's length bodies, and then it's, it's local authorities and, and going, and going <coughs> deeper, deeper into the system. And are you working with colleges, in effect, to get them to design courses yes. and curriculums that then 
our supply chain. Uh, that's exactly what we're doing. That's exactly what we're doing. And we're doing that because there's best practice in that area all over the UK in other parts of the national shipbuilding strategy. Um, uh, in Belfast, we know we need that. And there is a great desire on the part of those colleges to know more, more about the exact technical requirements that come out of certain uh, defence outputs. And there's a, a level of um, liaison. Um, we call it connect, collaborate, deliver. That's the mantra of the Maritime Enterprise Scheme. And that's what we're doing in the background all the time. Well, I think that's the untapped potential <laughs> to go back to in the command paper. Well, thank you very much indeed to the witnesses for giving evidence this morning, and thank you to colleagues for questions. Uh, order, order. The proceeding has ended. 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 The proceeding has ended.